Hello everyone, this is Bob and Threadbear, and welcome back to Bioshock Infinite. My apologies if I sound a bit off, but I'm currently in the depths of a pretty bad cold. Nice place they've got here. one where the applicant doesn't know he's being evaluated. <laughs> but I've watched you since the other day at the lottery. <laughs> You're a brute. And in times like this, I could use a brute. What do you want, Fink? My labor unrest is coming to it. <laughs> now, Fitzroy has got the jungle all riled up. <laughs> a man like me could have use of an old Pinkerton like you. This seems highly irregular, considering that most of this whole city wants him dead. You would think that Fink would take that into account when considering Booker's qualifications. That's all I'm saying. Well, looks like I can afford most of the stuff here, but uh, there's well, there's nothing for the hand cannon, so I'll just save up instead. Once again, this is all Fink's fault, quite specifically. Apparently the price of failure is to get strung up. Find Shen Lin and get the hell out of here. Thank you. Now, now, all I ask is that you finish what you started to it. Wouldn't want to disappoint the other applicants. Our first candidate is a veteran of Peking. Now, what's that they say about old soldiers? <laughs> Frankly, my money's on you. He's something of an old hand at handling explosives. Do the it. Only man okay. I know who hasn't <laughs> lost a limb working with them. Fireman Booker, <laughs> careful. Yet. Yeah, I figured. Now, how is this a fair competition, huh? I mean, when you got all of these guys fighting on that that dude's side, that's uh I mean, how is that a fair assessment? Come on, dude. Oh, crap. Alright, the gun is glowing now. I think that's an effect of one of my, uh, one of my gear equips. Alright, fireman's still out over there, but uh, I got my hand cannon ammunition here. There we go. Yeah, I was kind of low on health there for a bit. Alright, just gotta keep ahead of the fire grenades here. Oh crap. Quite the beaver, isn't he? Was not expecting him to uh, run out of health just from the crows like that. I'll, I'll tell you that. This young goal getter is a former devotee of Lady Comstock. But without the old gal, they don't know quite what to do with themselves. Damn it. There we go. Ho, ho, ho! Good show! Damn 
stop teleporting around like that. Come on, you sons of bitches. There we go. Oh, I gotcha. Oh, for crying out loud. Where's he even running off to here? Where do those people keep coming from? Nice. Alright, well, I got my health back. That's gonna help. All full on everything here. Okay, so, yeah, lots of turrets, and a patriot. So at this point, it's basically important to make sure that uh, not all of them have a good angle on me. RPG probably would come in handy here, but, I don't know, I'm gonna try and get around him. Well, aiming at the gears really isn't doing as much as I thought it would. I don't know. I guess the shotgun just isn't a good pick for a patriot. Oh, great. I'm almost dead again. Oh, for crying out loud. Yep, okay, that was completely my fault. I really should have checked my surroundings. Made sure I had gotten all of the damn balloon turrets first. As it is, it does look like... no, wait. Yep, there's another one of them flowing bastards. That's doing better though. Looks like it's just the one in the corner there now. Ooh. Nice. I mean, not as much hand cannon ammo as I would have liked, but still. So. Congratulations, DeWitt! You know, when your name was first passed to me, I wasn't quite sure you were the man for the job. <laughs> but now, I can say with certainty that I was quite wrong. I'm not interested in your job, Fink. Now, now, I know all about your little job for Fitzroy. But do you really want to take her offer over mine? Do you know how many people would kill to be head of Fix Security? <laughs> You're a tough nut to crack, Mr. DeWitt. A tough nut. <laughs> but I promise you this. I will get what I want. Yeah, well, good luck with that. And you're kind of low on heads of security. Can't imagine it'll be easy to track a guy down. Especially when, once again, the whole fucking city wants him dead. I mean, I, I get that he is not invested in the whole religious message aspect of this. I get that. He, it's, it's, he made it very clear before, but he still has to understand the fact that, you know, if everybody with a religious bent in a city founded by religious people, if all of them want a guy dead because they consider him an antichrist figure, 
then he might not be the most stable candidate for a job. That's all I'm saying. This is just back when having a moving picture was unique in itself. So it didn't matter that it was just of the scenery, but just the fact that it was a picture and it was moving and what the hell. Weird. Here's some cash. Just the fact that it was a picture and it was moving. It's enough to make it interesting. Hmm. Nah. Thinking maybe I'll wait for a better vigor. Or else I'll just wait for uh, hand cannon stuff to show up again. Not again, but just at all. Yeah, I saw it. No worries. Why would they stick a salt in the wine racks? Well, so anyway, it's a good thing I came down here. Not only is there a fair amount of money, but there's this infusion. Yay! Just what the doctor ordered. That's about everything now. Been upstairs, and you can't get onto the uh, right side balcony from here. Doesn't look like there's much left to explore aside from the stage. Nope, no way up there. Doesn't look like there's even a hint of... Booker, there's a door over here. I think that's the way down. Yes, well, thank you for being so obvious about it. I mean, the curtains did only raise once we uh, killed everybody in the room, so... You know, that wasn't obvious. I had thought you a fool, dear brother. When you told me that you heard wonderful music trumpeting from holes in the thin air, I began to doubt your mental integrity. But not only have you made your fortune from these two dads, you have lit the path for me as well. Gotta stop walking forward when I'm listening to something. Keep running into dialogue. Fight! Well, that was remarkably easy. Number nine. Hmm. Fancy putting those lock picking skills to work? Oh, this won't take long at all. I used to work for folks like Fink. Really? Yeah, I was with the Pinkertons. They'd call us in when the workers got restless. To do what? Demonstrate the folly of men striking, throwing down tools. You hurt people. I'll tell you this. Sometimes there's precious need for folks like Fitzroy. Why? Because of folks like me. There. See, now at least that was obvious. Yep, 
pros in a shotgun. There's only a couple normal folks around, that's really all you need. That's it. That's the book for the clock shop. Why are there so many Chen Lin posters down here? Is he spreading them around town or something? Seems like an odd thing for the man to do. Tell us what you know about Fitzroy, you goddamn duke. You know you can hear us. You want to say something? We want us to bring in Mrs. Lin for company. Yeah, throw a bucket of ice water on him. We got three more to bring in tonight. It's like they beat the shit out of him. Apparently, in that chair over there. Oh, what's that smell? Ain't no privies down here. They treat them like animals. Come on, buddy. That's right, there you go. To tax the black more than the white, is that not cruel? To forbid the mixing of the races, is that not cruel? To give the vote to the white man and deny it to the yellow. What have people the have done to deserve to be locked up in a place like this? Think don't need much of a reason. No. No, he doesn't. Or drown your flock under an ocean of water. Cruelty can be instructive. And what is Columbia if not the schoolhouse of the Lord? Oh, hey. It's Slate. He looks. You were right. Sparing him was no mercy. I wonder if he's thinking about what he's done, or if he's just gone catatonic. Oh, lovely. I would even have all that salt on him. But yeah, I'm not going to repeat that last Comstock quote. It's just basically... Can you get this open? Come on. Give me something challenging. It's basically okay, so God also did nasty Ready. things to people. More money. Catch, Mr. DeWitt. And because God is good, that means that we can do nasty things to people too and still call ourselves good people. Uh, no. I'm never getting a new shirt. Help me out with this lock? Seems easy enough. This is it, isn't it? Yep. Number nine. There. Do it! You're a lion. But you can't blame me for looking after my own interests, can you? Now I know Fitzroy has come calling, but I think you'll find your business with her has come to an end. <laughs> lions walk with lions, Do it! Not hyenas! Okay, so, you know, if you would just offer us an airship, this would, he would probably accept the offer and we would be done with this. It really doesn't strike me as that complicated, honestly. It, except that suddenly this happens. Now we need to find someone else to make those guns. No. Dead is dead, Elizabeth. Dead is dead. What? Where the hell did... I see heads. And I see tails. It's all a matter of perspective. Why are you following us? Who sent you? Comstock? What do you want What do you see here, from this angle? Dead. Listen. And that angle? Alive. Walker. Chen Lin. The body's gone. It was never here. 
It's another Columbia. A different Columbia. The same coin. A different perspective. Heads. Tails. Dead. Alive. We have to go through to this other Columbia, but how? It's like riding a bicycle. One never really forgets. One just needs the courage to climb aboard. If we go into this tear, I don't think I'll be able to bring us back. Are you sure you're ready? Well, it's not like I'm hanging out here for my health. Okay, open it. <laughs> Alright. So, last time we sort of skirted around the meat of the issue, but this time we'll be heading straight to the creamy center. For today's History Corner, let's take a look at the history of the American labor movement. Medieval Origins The earliest precursors to modern unions are probably the artisan guilds of medieval Europe. These guilds were comprised of tradesmen who banded together in order to present a united front to government, to related industries, and to their customers. As a positive force, guilds protected and defended their members. They arranged for apprenticeships, and through that system they guaranteed a certain standard of quality, and they helped spread the spirit of nationalism and internationalism against the opposing spirits of sectarianism and isolationism. But, as a negative force, guilds used that apprenticeship system to promote nepotism and keep outsiders from getting in. They leaned on their governments to get kickbacks and favors. They used their monopoly power to fix prices and stamp out competition. And they fiercely opposed any innovation or new development which could threaten their industrial sector. For instance, in the 16th century, Queen Elizabeth I of England issued an edict demanding that every subject should wear a knitted cap on Sundays. She did so in order to shore up demand for domestic English wool. In 1589, a man named William Lee invented the first automated knitting machine, but the Queen denied him a patent, claiming it would drive knitters into unemployment. While guilds were not directly a party to this incident, it's certainly true that as the government, Queen Elizabeth was looking out for the guild's best interests. As organizations go, medieval guilds had characteristics which we'd associate both with modern unions and modern corporations. It's easy to understand why that is if you think about it. Back before factories took off, the workers were, for the most part, the business owners. Mind you, there was still plenty of room at the top for greedy assholes to take money and credit from the people doing the actual work, and since the guilds needed government permission to maintain their monopolies, they were usually run by relatives and cronies of the nation's monarch. The old guilds eventually fell for two reasons. First, the mechanization of the Industrial Revolution did exactly what the guilds were fearing and replaced their jobs with machines. So yeah, that's a process that's been going on for the past 300 years. The other reason is that the power of the guilds was tied to the power of the monarchs. And so as the latter fell, the former were dissolved in order to allow for greater competition and innovation. American Labor Organized labor in America is as old as America itself. The first New World strike occurred in 1768 in New York City. Twenty journeyman tailors walked out on their jobs in order to protest a wage reduction. Skilled labor unions, the direct descendants of the old guilds, popped up in major American cities starting with the Federal Society of Journeyman Cordwainers in 1794, which was based exclusively in Philadelphia despite the name. Over time, unions such as these expanded their influence, and in 1852, the International Typographical Union brought together unions from across the United States and Canada. Still, for the most part, these modern guilds represented one skilled trade each, and like their forebears, they fought against innovation and competition in order to protect the livelihoods of their members. It would take until the spread of fully mechanized factories for unskilled labor unions to start 
becoming a thing. Automated production caused a significant paradigm shift, mostly thanks to two important facts. First, the machines were easier to learn and to operate than the tools of an artisanal trade, which made it easier to train and to replace workers. Second, the employers were no longer masters of the trade, but instead they were bosses whose training and responsibilities were based around wrangling a large workforce and keeping production up, rather than spending years learning and practicing a trade and only then turning around to manage and train a workshop full of other artisans. Mind you, this business model existed before the Industrial Revolution, but you previously only saw it on farms, not in cities. And while there's always been a distance between employers and employees, in the age of factory labor, that distance only increased. The first real modern union was the National Labor Union, formed in 1866, shortly after the Civil War. The NLU brought together all sorts of unions from across the country, both for skilled and unskilled labor, and they stressed collective bargaining and arbitration over strikes and sabotage. They also stressed the eight-hour workday, a demand that began way back in 1817. And hell, you, <laughs> you know what the funny thing about the eight-hour day is? That's about as much effort as a worker puts in regardless of the number of hours he or she is required to work. For the rest of the time, the workers just find ways to goof off without the bosses noticing. Anyway, the NLU supported the American worker, but it hated immigrants, particularly the Chinese, for taking our jobs. And it only made halting efforts to support women and black workers. And it shares these characteristics with its successors. The NLU died when it decided to go into politics and then made an awful showing at the polls. Overall, it only lasted eight years. But, in 1869, the Knights of Labor formed to continue where the NLU left off. And by 1886, the KOL represented 800,000 men and, well, mostly men. But around 20% of all American workers. Unfortunately, the 1880s is also when the robber barons and monopolists were reaching the height of their power. And so over the next few decades, the federal government came down increasingly hard on unions, socialists, and other agitators. By 1890, KOL membership had dropped to 100,000. The 1893 Depression also did a number on the KOL, since, well, unemployed workers can't afford union dues. Meanwhile, the American Federation of Labor formed in 1886. The AFL began when the KOL leadership wanted the skilled labor unions to drop out of their respective craft unions and let the KOL represent them directly. The members didn't want to risk that, and so they dropped out and formed the AFL. The AFL would go on to define the American labor movement for the next 50 years. But that is another story that shall be told another time. Escalating Conflicts The 1880s is also when the Pinkertons entered the stage. The Pinkerton Detective Agency was formed by Allen and Robert Pinkerton in Chicago in 1850. From the very start, the agency provided private and criminal investigation services, along with private security. Remember, at this point in history, the idea of a civic police force was still a novel concept and a lot of the municipal services we take for granted today, stuff like the police, firefighters, road maintenance, they started out as private competing businesses who could be hired by individuals, by corporations, and by local, state, and federal governments. The Pinkerton Agency got a big boost during the Civil War when it uncovered an assassination plot against Abraham Lincoln in 1861. And after that, Lincoln hired them to act as his personal bodyguards, and as spies in the Confederacy. After the war, they continued to act in roles which would later be filled by the FBI, the CIA, and the Secret Service. And their We Never Sleep logo is the origin of the term Private Eye. And what may be even crazier is the fact that the Pinkertons are around to this very day, and they continue to provide both security and intelligence services to whomever can afford them. Anyway, 
1884, the Pinkerton Agency passed to Allen's sons, who would focus on hiring themselves out as strike breakers and corporate enforcers. The agency's reputation took a nosedive thanks to how violently they would oppose unions, the most notorious example being the Homestead Strike of 1892. This strike was between a steelworkers union and the Carnegie Steel Company in Homestead, Pennsylvania. Publicly, at least, Carnegie was in favor of unions, but evidently he hated this one in particular and wanted it to die. His man in charge of the plant intentionally sabotaged negotiations, and as he waited for the union's contract to expire, he turned the factory into a goddamn fortress complete with walls stocked with barbed wire and water cannons installed at every gate. 300 armed Pinkertons were brought in to man the defenses, but when they ran into the strikers on the way in, battle broke out, killing 11 men. Ultimately, they failed to take the walls, and so the state governor, who was elected thanks to Carnegie's political machine, sent in the Pennsylvania militia to break the strike. Personal Thoughts should I say that I'm pro-union or anti-union? What do you think? What's best? I mean, collective bargaining rights certainly come in handy, especially when someone is trying to take advantage of how vulnerable you are as an individual. Hell, that's the advantage of health insurance, the single-payer system when it comes to health care. Even conservatives will admit that health insurance is better than going without. They'd have to be hypocrites to say that people don't need collective bargaining rights. But it's not like unions' hands are clean either. Unions have a bad reputation among immigrants, black men, and all women. Because despite saying that we're all in this together, the AFL lobbied to restrict immigration in the 1920s and beyond, and they also quite intentionally avoided representing black Americans and women despite preaching equality in their rhetoric. Unions also tended to associate with organized crime for a while, in part because, for a while, they were an organized crime. And it is possible for unions to press too hard and demand too much money from their employers and their customers. They could also demand high union dues and shut unemployed workers out of decent jobs, much like the old medieval guilds. Strong unions lead to a strong economy because they encourage companies to spend money on their workers. But they also raise the price of products because companies tend to pass on the added expense to the customer. So which is better, empowered consumers or lower prices? Both. Either one. See, I'd rather have the conflict continue than for one side or the other to win. If one group wins, then they will abuse their power, no matter what that power is, no matter who wins, no matter what they stood for before winning. That's just the nature of power, the nature of the social contract. That's why I'm a centrist, really. Because I don't want anyone to win the game. If someone wins, then the game is over. And if the game ends, no one can earn any more points. No new players can join in. So my advice to you is to never give up. Never surrender. And perhaps most important of all, never let yourself win. Thanks for joining me again in History Corner, and I hope I'll see you soon.